Welcome to She Said Homestead, the podcast that explores homesteading from a range of perspectives. We're Sage and Michaela, two homesteaders, each with unique experiences, properties, and future goals for our homesteads. We're discussing various homesteading topics, sharing our personal experiences as women working full-time who are managing homesteads as well, and shining a light on the stories of other inspiring homesteaders. Before we dive in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review. It really helps us grow and share these homesteading stories with even more people. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Sage from Terrano Acres. And I'm Michaela from Calico Cow Acres, and we both have homesteads in Western North Carolina. Today, we're going to be talking all about soil, but before we get into that, why don't you tell me a little bit about your week, Michaela? To start off, we got a hurricane. (laughs) We got the outer bands of Hurricane Debbie, so everybody listening to this is going to know how far behind we are with recording. It started raining that morning, Thursday morning, I think it was at like 9 30 and it was raining until like 10 30 p.m then it paused and kept raining for a little while and we got i think around five or six inches of rain the garden was flooded the chicken runs were flooded they were, looked like drowned rats i felt so bad <laughs> they're all like under their coop and stuff they have places to go but they just they like to be out in it at the same time i don't understand The ducks had the best day ever because obviously they like the water. So our whole property was pretty much flooded, which we're kind of used to, but I didn't actually think we were going to get the hurricane rain. Um, I thought it was going to miss us. So I was a little bit surprised. It was kind of, in my mind, it was a little bit out of nowhere, (laughs) but the garden seems to be doing okay still. I think it recovered just fine. Most of the water rolls down the hill towards the coop and then down into the orchard. So I think it kind of left the soil up there pretty quickly, at least. And the melons are going crazy now because of all that rain. So I harvested my first few melons out of the garden, like crack them open in the garden and eat them with my hands style. (laughs) It was like, uh, it's been like walking through the tunnel and you can just smell cantaloupe and you're like, oh, well, there's got to be a ripe one somewhere. And there's there's been a few. There was actually a few overripe ones. So my chickens have gotten some. I just filmed a garden tour for August, which I meant to film in late July. So, you know, we're a few weeks late on that. And we've also kind of been working on some inside house things. We started Taylor's home and he's been working on the joists again. So I've kind of been hanging out downstairs with him while he works on those. And then this past weekend, we drove over to Hendersonville and the Home Depot, and we picked out our exact floors that we're hopefully going to be getting this weekend. I'm super excited. How long have you guys lived in that house with just the subfloors? <laughs> well, since we moved in, like it's not head floors. We the day that we put our camper on the property, we rip, we started ripping the floors out of the house because they were they were like old laminate floors and they were just waterlogged and moldy. And then the upper layer of subfloor was also waterlogged and moldy. So we only have one layer of subfloor and it flexes under your feet and it's very scary. <laughs> and I'm I'm ready for floors. It's been almost two years. Yeah, you deserve you deserve those floors. <laughs> I put my time in. So yeah, hopefully, I think with my next paycheck this week, we'll be able to go get them. And then Taylor officially fully fixed my car, the X5, tonight. Like, it's done. It can drive. We just need to get plates for it on Thursday, and then we can go get floors. We would have probably gotten them last weekend, but we just had his car, and 45 boxes of floors wasn't going to fit in there. (laughs) (laughs) And the truck is still out of commission, right? Yeah, that's going to be out of commission for a while. That's going to be probably a two or three thousand dollar fix because he's got to replace the whole transmission. So the X5 can do pretty much everything the truck can do other than hauling our camper um, around anywhere but our property. We were able to move it with the X5 just like in our driveway, but even that was a little sketchy. So we're not going to we're not going to do that. But the X5 is basically a truck anyway, so. We have a vehicle to haul things in and we can haul a trailer if we need to borrow the neighbor's trailer and stuff now. So 
<laughs> we're finally getting a little bit more on track. <laughs> and then yesterday we bottled up some of our first batches of mead that we made earlier in the summer. So I'm I'm really excited to let those age a bit further, but the flavors on them are super, super yummy. We're definitely going to be making more of those like right away so that we can continue to let them age. We picked out our cider flavors for the year. We're going to be doing some five gallon batches and one gallon batches. So we're going to be needing a lot of cider. And then the last thing that kind of went down here this past week was one of our roosters is having an issue with his foot. I think our other rooster might have injured him. So he's been limping. So we had to like catch him and he's in quarantine now. So we're back to basement bird hospital. He's actually not downstairs. He's just outside the basement door in the, the mini coop. But yeah, that's been a bummer. I'm I'm hoping he's okay, but I have no clue what's wrong with him. It never ends with the animal shenanigans, it seems like. It's- it's For any roosters. homesteader, not just you. <laughs> yeah. No. These dang roosters. So the cider flavors that you're doing this year, are you doing any this year that you did last year because you like them so much? Or are they all going to be new? I think we're redoing all of the flavors we did last year because we liked them all. But we're going to do most of those will be in five gallon batches. There were four flavors last year. So I think we're doing all of those in five gallons this year instead. And then we're going to try new flavors in the one gallon batches so that we can taste them and make sure we like them. So we're going to have a lot lot of cider this year. I think I calculated needing like 15 bushels of apples for the amount of cider we want to make. Not just hard cider, like regular cider too. And um, we're planning to get some mini kegs so that we can carbonate them because the carbonation, I actually have one right here. The carbonation on most of them wasn't great with the drop things that you put in them, but you can see if you're watching this, you can see there's like some carbonation in here. It's really hit or miss. So we're going to carbonate the five gallon batches and then we're going to do a non-alcoholic carbonated cider too, because that sounds really yummy. All sorts of flavors. That reminds me that reminds me that I still have my stash of cider to go through that I've forgotten that I <laughs> need need to work on so that I can reuse those bottles again this year. <laughs> go get one right now. <laughs> that was my whole list for the week. What what were you up to this week? This week I saw that the local plant nursery by me got their seed garlic and they posted it on Instagram and then I immediately <laughs> Went there after work and got my first pick of their seed garlic because I didn't pre-order it through anybody. Everybody that I looked at that I was going to think about pre-ordering it from was out of their primary varieties that I was interested in. And I was like, yeah, I know that the place down the road, small business, local is going to have the garlic I want anyway. So whatever. So I picked that up. That felt good. I also pre-ordered my Dahlia's for next year, which feels a little weird because my dahlias that I planted this year just started blooming. So I'm not used to being in that headspace, but they uh, they got me. They posted on Instagram and it was a sale through Swan Island dahlias, uh, like sale for pre-order. And I was like, well, OK, uh, now that I know that I know how to save dahlias to reuse them next year. It's just dangerous because I'm like, well, it's an investment. Like, I'm going to have this and <laughs> I'm going to split it and make so many dahlias out of it. And <laughs> like, it really, it's $20 for like unlimited dahlias. So it would be dumb if I didn't get it. <laughs> that's uh, that's where my head's been at. So <laughs> dangerous game, but I pre-ordered it and I'm, I'm done with it. I'm not going <laughs> to let myself order anymore because I already have almost more all youtubers and i know what to do with but they're my favorite flower so whatever i also got my first slicing tomatoes so i've gotten cherry tomatoes i have uh i've picked several paste tomatoes but this was the first of the slicing tomatoes which are the biggest and that's where they take the longest and so i had a big gorgeous yellow brandy wine that i cut and toasted bread 
put some homemade mayo on that, sliced the tomato up, put it on there, sprinkled some salt on, and then topped it with an egg or a couple eggs from the homestead, obviously, and had this like awesome, delicious, yummy meal that was so satisfying. The only thing that wasn't homemade was the bread because I don't have time to be making bread right now, so that was store bought, but it was still good. To be fair, that also heats up your house a lot, and it is the middle of summer, so I don't blame you. And I did actually take a day this weekend to leave the homestead, which, whoa, that rarely happens. But I was driving through South Carolina. I was on the highway, and I wasn't I wasn't looking for produce. I wasn't planning to stop, but I passed uh, one of those roadside stands, and they had peaches. And I was like, I have to stop for peaches. <laughs> I have to. So I got, I don't even know how many pounds, probably roughly 20 pounds of peaches. And so I preserved some of those and a bunch of other things I did. I did some peach jam. I did some wineberry jam. I did some candied jalapenos. I froze some squash. I froze some beans. I dried some peppers. Like I just, this weekend, I just put food away because I know from last year that if I don't make myself do it, it will go bad in the fridge and turn into chicken food or compost. And I, I, it's heartbreaking when that happens. So I took one day off the homestead and then the second day I just spent spent it in the kitchen basically and then the last thing for this week that's sad news is that i did lose a sheep and that that has been sad you know every time i walk up to the pasture i'm like oh rocky's not there so that was difficult that was unexpected it doesn't change or hinder any of my plans for dairy he was going to be a weather so Basically, I'll probably just keep one of the lambs in the spring and use him as a wither. But it's still losing the animal. That's always hard. And uh, I buried him on the homestead where he's got good good vantage point. And he'll be remembered. And that's that. That's part of homesteading. Yeah. Yeah, that happened right before we recorded last week, right? Literally right before we recorded last week, and I couldn't talk about it last week yet, so. That's fair. I don't think anybody can blame you for that. It's tough. Yeah. Moving on to today's topic is all about soil. And just to give you guys a little bit of background, I have my degree in geology. I graduated from University of Georgia with a bachelor's degree in geology, but I also got a minor in ecology specifically so that I could take multiple soil science classes. And I currently also work as an environmental consultant where I deal primarily with soil remediation. So soil (laughs) has been very much uh, part of my life. It's a focus of my life, both in homesteading and professionally. So just to give you an idea, when when we're talking about this, this is largely where this information is coming from, is from formal education, but also experience. And I am just here for the ride, like everybody else. (laughs) (laughs) So yesterday, I posted on my social media, and I think that we posted on She Said Homestead to asking for your guys' questions about soil and anything surrounding soil that we could potentially help answer and do some research and just give you guys some information on it. And so we're going to be trying to incorporate some of those questions throughout this whole episode. So if you asked one of those questions, keep listening and hopefully we'll be able to answer it for you. I also have some questions in here that I thought would be interesting to have Sage kind of elaborate on. So let's start off with, this one was my favorite question that we got, and I actually think it's a really good question. And that one was, what is soil and how is it different from dirt? Right. So soil essentially is just broken down rocks plus organic matter. So it's different from dirt because dirt would be just the inorganic components of soil. It's just those broken down rocks. You know, you hold it in your hand. You don't really think of it as having much life. It's kind of dusty. It's kind of dry. It's just brown. And so it's those non-living, non-organic parts of soil. What are the different categories of soil? That depends on who you're talking to. So geologists and engineers will describe soil using the United Soil Classification System. As a geologist, I think 
that system is stupid. Going on the record, I don't like it. <laughs> uh, so soil scientists and most other disciplines will use the USDA soil taxonomy. It's going to be a little different country to country, but being the USDA soil taxonomy, obviously that's for the U.S., and there's lots of different ways to talk about soil, but mostly what we're concerned with as gardeners and homesteaders, we want to talk about the soil texture. When I was first looking at my property, when I was looking at every property we were planning on touring, I am the kind of person who I'll go on to the county GIS website, which is basically like a mapping website and it gives you a ton of information about your property and one of the layers that's on that website is usually what soils are on your property and they kind of like map it out for you what are those usually based on like what are those uh codes i guess is what they're called because i've always looked at them and then like research what they're saying but i don't remember what like where i'm looking to find that information Yes. And actually, even beyond county resources, there's the Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, which is good for the entire country. And I'll throw a link to their website down below. But they they have a way that you can look up your address. You can find that no matter where you are. Um, so the county is probably getting their information from NRCS because they are tasked with compiling all that data for, for the entire U.S., Second question, where do those classifications come from? That's also part of soil taxonomy. And I spent years <laughs> learning soil taxonomy. So I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, all the details of what that is, because there's there's orders, there's subgroups, there's groups like it gets it gets heavy into it. But you can look up what you have on your property. You can then take what they call it and throw it into Google. And you'll be able to learn a lot from there. But again, you know, as gardeners and homesteaders, it really ultimately is going to come back to looking at the soil texture. That was something that was so interesting to me to like look into and see what the descriptions of those were, because we have multiple on our property. And it's it's interesting now being here, knowing like, OK, that makes sense because like the landscape changes in these certain spots and like it makes sense that the soil would be different. So I was just curious if that was based on the one that you said was stupid or if it was the taxonomy one. <laughs> no, that's the good one. That's not the one that's stupid. That's the one I like. That's the one that yeah. makes sense. So, yeah, if you're looking for a property or you're curious about what soil is on your property, you can go to one of those locations, whether it's your county GIS site or what was the one you said? I don't remember the acronym. It's the NRCS, and we can absolutely throw a link to that down in the description. Okay, so the next question we have is, what factors contribute to soil textures? Right, so soil texture is going to be determined by essentially the proportionality of your soil grain sizes. And from largest to smallest, that's going to be sand, silt, and clay. Those are the basic components. Those are the basic building blocks of soil. And none of this strictly takes into account, you know, proportionality of organic matter. That's kind of separate. So what is the best soil texture then? Especially as gardeners, you know, the quote unquote ideal soil texture would be loam, which to be simplistic for the sake of this conversation, is a little bit of each of the three grain sizes. It's m not totally, but more or less a balance of each of those three. And then, you know, you can have a little bit more sand in it, and that would be like a sandy loam. You can have a little bit more silt in it. That would be a silty loam. You could have a little bit more clay in it. That would be a clay loam. And all of those, even though they're not perfectly loam, are still really ideal to garden in but you might start to struggle if you move you know farther away from center farther away from balance where if you have too much sand you might struggle to retain water and if you have too much clay you might struggle with you know holding too much water which is it seems like that's some of the soil that you have on your property is really clay heavy yeah it's extremely clay like i think we could build a pond without adding any extra clay to it that's how solid it is <laughs> okay so i'm curious then 
when we talk about improving soil, does that mean kind of creating that balance between those textures or is that that something else? It can be either. So something about soil is when, when we're discussing improving soil, we're usually talking about the topsoil. So if you were to dig a hole, you would probably notice that the first couple inches or first few inches is really dark. And then underneath that is totally different. And the topsoil is going to be what's really important to us as gardeners is where most of the plants are going to get their nutrients. Um, and so when we're, when we're talking about improving soil, we're mostly talking about the topsoil, not the subsoil. And when we're talking about building topsoil, I mean, you totally could, especially with your soil, you know, haul in a bunch of sand if you wanted to and go through all this time and effort and energy to get it closer to loam. But ultimately, there are easier ways to do that, especially with organic matter. And so that's where it gets a little bit tricky balancing the soil textures, which are one thing, and then the percentage of organic matter, which tends to be kind of in its own category. I can't remember exactly which episode we've talked about this. I know we briefly touched on it. And I know that we talked about how everybody, like depending on your location, you're going to have a different amount of topsoil. But we haven't really talked about how if you don't have a ton of topsoil in your location or you want to improve it, like how you can keep building that up on your property. Right. So what makes really quality topsoil, regardless of your soil texture, is how much organic matter it contains. So basically, if you want to build topsoil, you're just going to add organic matter to it. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. You know, as gardeners, we're used to amending the topsoil by just throwing a bunch of compost in it most of the time. Uh, but there are, you know, slower ways that you can do that if you don't want to invest in the compost uh, to, to throw on there, which I don't. <laughs> you can add mulch that will slowly decompose and add organic matter to your soil. You can grow plants in the soil and leave it there. And, you know, inevitably when it dies off in the winter, that's going to decompose and add that organic matter to your soil. You can also put animals on it. That's one of the ways that I have worked on my pasture, which was not in great condition when I moved here. And so, you know, years of moving chickens on it, all of their manure has added to the organic matter in the soil. And there's actually some evidence that practices like rotational grazing, where you're only allowing your ruminants access to a portion of the pasture at a time, that the root kill and the cycle of that adds organic matter to your soil because the roots decompose into that. But the tricky thing about building topsoil is, you know, you can add all the organic matter you want to it, but you've got to figure out a way to keep it there because if you're not keeping it there, then it's just washing away. And so that's probably one of the main reasons that we like to mulch things, right? Because we're trying to make sure that the the compost and the organic material isn't just washing away. I know that in my garden this past year, we've talked about this, how the beds that I covered, I can definitely tell the difference in that top few inches of soil. Everything stayed where it is. It's nice and soft and fluffy. And then the beds that I didn't get covered this year were just like rocks on top. So I definitely think some of that er eroded away. So is that why erosion is such a big issue? Exactly. If what you're adding to the soil, what you're working so hard to add is, you know, washing away with the rain or in some cases is even blowing away with the wind, then it's not going to do you any good. So because topsoil is at the top of the soil, it's at the surface, it's susceptible to all of these surface processes that we have. Obviously, we need rain, but rain can also be erosive. And so the best way to hold that material in place is going to be by covering the soil surface somehow. There are lots of different ways you can do that. It doesn't matter if it's covered with leaves or wood chips or grass or straw, or if there is grass growing, you know, on that soil surface that live vegetation is also going to hold it in place. And so that physical barrier is going to be what provides a shield for the topsoil to help everything stay where you want it to stay. And that's why we have kudzu. <laughs> <laughs>
But in reality, that is why we have kudzu, right? I'm pretty sure that it was brought over here for erosion purposes, and now it's just everything. That sounds right, so I'll roll with it, sure. I'm pretty sure, I've looked this up before, and I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was brought over here in like the 1800s to control erosion, and it severely got out of hand. And now everything is kudzu down here. With things potentially washing away with erosion and trying to build your topsoil, how do you make sure that the nutrients are kind of staying where they need to and you're actually like giving your plants what they need? No matter what kind of soil texture you have and almost regardless of how much organic matter you have in the soil, knowing your nutrient balance is important. And so there's three main soil nutrients. It's not all of them, but it's the main ones, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Sometimes you will hear those shorthand referred to as your NPK ratio. So the N is nitrogen, the P is phosphorus, and the K is potassium, because for whatever reason, that's the elemental symbol for potassium. Don't ask me. I didn't make the rules. And these three main nutrients are important because they each serve a major function. So nitrogen is going to be what grows your leaves. Phosphorus is going to be what grows your flowers. And potassium is going to be what grows your roots. So there's there's two ways you can do this. There's a low maintenance option for figuring out what your nutrient ratio looks like. And there's a high maintenance option. So the low maintenance option is going to be paying attention to how things grow. If you are lacking nitrogen in your soil, your leaves aren't going to look lush and bright and green. They're going to look, you know, either small or maybe they're yellowing. So because it's the leaves that are suffering, that gives you the clue that, hey, it's probably nitrogen. If you have lush green plants, you know, for example, tomato plants, but they're not putting any flowers out, then that would give you a clue that maybe your soil is deficient in phosphorus. So you can use those context clues looking at how things grow to figure out what's not happening, what they're probably lacking. Now, that takes time, that takes patience, that takes a little bit of, you know, trial and error. And if you just want to get started faster or have more definitive answers, you can do the high maintenance option, which is actually not all that high maintenance, <laughs> and that is getting your soil tested. So you can collect soil samples from your garden, from your property, wherever you want. I do recommend collecting multiple because soil, even in a small space, can can vary. Um, but you can collect those soil samples and all I can speak for is in the US in America. I know how that works. I don't know how it works in other countries, but essentially you get with your your agricultural extension office in your county and they will tell you a place that you can send your soil samples. It usually goes to a university that is in your state. And I forget who it is for North Carolina. Do you remember? It's NC State. I know it's University of Georgia in Georgia because that's where I went and they would do soil samples. But um, you can get with your agricultural extension office. They'll help you. They'll tell you the whole process. They'll tell you where to send it. And it's it's not too expensive. I think it's usually about $9 per sample. And sometimes if you submit it in the off season, if you submit it in winter, it's a little cheaper <laughs> if you want to get that cheat code. But they will tell you your exact NPK breakdown, and then they'll also tell you other handy things like what your pH level is too. Yeah, I think it's Clemson for South Carolina, NC State for North Carolina. I'm not 100% sure on South Carolina though. And then if you're anywhere else, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually, I was having this issue earlier in the year a couple months ago with my tomatoes. I was thinking that I might have that issue where I had too much nitrogen and not enough of the other things, but I think it was more the weather that was messing with it, not actually my my balance of things. That That's also something to note, is that like it might not be just your soil, it could be other factors, but soil is definitely something that plays a role. With that being said, if your soil is deficient, how do you go about fixing that? You can... You can do it a few ways. I feel like <laughs> I feel like a broken record. You have multiple options here. Um, so the first way that a lot of people think of is adding fertilizer. And something to know if you're going to deal in fertilizer is that it's listed again in that NPK ratio. 
So if you have identified that your soil is deficient in nitrogen, then you're going to want something that has a high first number and then low numbers for uh, potassium and phosphorus. If you have identified that you have a phosphorus issue, but your nitrogen and your potassium are fine, then you're going to want a fertilizer that has a high middle number, but not necessarily the other two. So it's there is chemistry kind of involved when you're dealing with fertilizer. And you can also add too much fertilizer, which can sometimes be just as harmful as having soil that's deficient in nutrients. So if you're going to deal with fertilizer, either do your research or, again, talk to your agricultural extension office. Those people are so, so helpful. And if fertilizer just doesn't really sound like a road that you want to go down, that's totally okay. We're going to go back to, hey, okay, how do I build my topsoil? And that's going to go back to adding organic matter. And we've already talked a little bit about how to add organic matter to your soil. And the benefit of doing it this way instead of adding fertilizer is that it's going to be much harder to end up burning your plants. It's going to be much harder to throw things out of balance if you're adding organic matter. Compost and all of those other things are much more forgiving than adding chemical fertilizer to your soil. I feel like that covers a lot of topsoil and like garden soil related things. But what are some other not topsoil specific issues that you could potentially encounter on your homestead property? Great question. So the first one that comes to mind is pH. Even though it's not a nutrient, it still matters a lot because it can actually affect how your how available the nutrients in the soil are to your plants. Honestly, pH, going into that full explanation, goes down a chemistry rabbit hole that makes my brain hurt. So (laughs) for the sake of simplicity, you know, what you ultimately need to know is that it just affects how bioavailable the nutrients are in your soil. So you can have just enough nitrogen in your soil, but if you have really acidic conditions or really basic conditions, maybe that nitrogen wouldn't be as bioavailable. You can ha- you can also have the opposite issue where maybe something is too bioavailable because the pH is off and it ends up causing toxicity for your plant. So most of the time we're looking for a pH range between 6 and 7.5. So lower than 6 would be too acidic and higher than 7.5 would be too basic. You can also have plants like blueberries that love a pH of 5.5. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, 6 to 7.5 is pretty ideal. And if you're wanting to amend it, you know, if you have acidic soil that you want to pull back into more balance, you're probably going to want to do something like add lime. I like to add wood ash. Um, And then if you have soil that's too basic, you're going to want to apply something like aluminum sulfate. Uh, But that's, that's a more rare case. Usually it's, you know, us people in the South with the clay soil, uh, the really acidic soil trying to get things back to more neutral. I have a question. I've had a lot of people say that there are certain things that grow really well here, like the rhododendron and berries and whatnot because they like the acidic clay. Why is the clay acidic? Ooh, okay. So that ties a little bit into the chemistry rabbit hole, but I think that I can explain that a little bit. So it has to do with cation exchange. (laughs) Um, And so clay is really interesting because there are things that it's called adsorb which is with a D instead of a B. It's not absorbed, but it's adsorbed. So things like to to cling onto the surface of the clay particle. Um, and so it it changes how things are available and, and behave in the soil in a way that can then affect the power of hydrogen or the pH of the soil. And that is that is the simplest way that I know to put that without genuinely getting into a chemistry lesson that I would confuse myself with. <laughs> that's really interesting. I, I seriously did not know that. And I doubt that that's that specific information is common knowledge other than clay equals acidic. So I've always wondered that. <laughs> <laughs> you can also have soil that's too salty. This isn't too common of an issue really you're only going to see this in places that are really really dry but 
it is something that can happen. And honestly, it's a little bit hard to fix. Basically, you're going to be stuck either, you know, making raised beds and importing new material and growing in that or importing new material to dilute the salt buildup. The only other thing you can really do about that is water it like a ton. And if you're already in a place that's really dry, you probably have water restrictions or that wouldn't be a responsible thing to do. So if you're in, you know, a desert area, just be aware that that's something that you could contend with. Something that's a little bit more relevant for most of us is, you know, you can also have compacted soil, which I know I dealt with and continue to deal with here just because there have been so many horses here and they've been compacting the soil for a long time, especially in a small area where I have my garden now. So ultimately, this is just going to take a little bit of time. There's not necessarily a perfect easy fix. What most of us will do to get the the quickest resolution or quickest fix is tilling it. But fun fact, that actually does lead to more subsurface compaction, even though your, you know, your growing space might be good. It's going to end up compacting the subsurface even more and then causing more long-term issues. So what I did with my garden was to broad fork it and give it time. Um, and it's actually pretty interesting now. So there's the pathways and then there's the growing spaces, which are the rows. And if you take a shovel and you just throw it into the rows where I've been cultivating it and broad forking it and mulching it and everything else, it goes in. And if you if you take it two inches over and put it in the pathway, you just you just get refusal. It doesn't go in. So Broad forking, yes, it's work and being patient. Yes, it's difficult, but I can attest to it does show results. Poor drainage is also going to be another common one and can be related to compacted soil. So part of the reason that compacted soil can be an issue is that it can prevent, you know, the rainwater or whatever water from infiltrating and it's going to flow across the surface. It's going to cause erosion. It's going to flood your property. You're going to have a whole headache. So if you notice that areas are ponding with water or if they're staying soggy for a really long time, those would be the indications that you have maybe some poorly draining soil. And this could be from a few different things, you know. You deal with a lot of flooding and a lot of ponding because you have clay heavy soil. And that's just kind of how clay is. It can also be a function of topography. If you have a low lying spot on your property, even if it's good soil, even if it's not compacted, it could be soggy just because that's where water's flowing. It's not always an indication that something is wrong with your soil. And sometimes you have to work with your property instead of against it. I wonder what the flow of water was before they regraded this whole area in whatever, like right after the Dust Bowl when that was like a mandatory thing they had to do. And that's why we have our berms and that's why it holds water and directs water in certain areas. Like that's why we have streams and it pools up and whatnot. Like I always wonder what it, what happened before then because it has like very specific routes that it takes now and you can tell that they like designed it that way um so i'm just curious like i wish i i wish i could know uh how it was naturally before they did all of that yeah and even before that it was just straight forest right so all of that leaf litter all of the trees and all the things that are live and in the soil act as a sponge when you get really heavy rain and and help to to keep it from becoming basically a river so if you have poor drainage and you're looking for a solution for it really you're going to have to determine what the cause is in order to fix it again if it's topography there's probably not fixing it that's probably just how it's going to be and you have to work with it but if you you know if it's from clay heavy soil or if it's from compaction you can you can work to relieve that over time but there's probably not going to be a quick fix for that you can also deal with shallow bedrock where basically it's just going to be a really small amount of soil from the surface until where you would not be able to dig any farther with a shovel and that can be an issue because it doesn't give your plants a really healthy root zone to grow in but also it can 
lead to poor drainage because there's just not a lot of space for that water to go. Soil, you know, something that we don't think about often is that soil is a reservoir for water. Water doesn't just flow across the surface of soil. It infiltrates in. The soil takes it in like a sponge, and then it kind of flows in the subsurface, which is what groundwater is. And if you have really shallow bedrock, there's just not a lot of, you know, we'll call it volume in that sponge. There's not a lot of places for that water to go. And so that can cause issues in a couple different ways. And then the last of these sort of other issues that I'll touch on is potential contamination. So that could be herbicides, that could be metals, that could be something else entirely. And there are things you can do, but there's not a ton of things that you can do. So honestly, in my opinion, this is something to be aware of so you can plan where you're putting your garden or, you know, plan where you're not putting your garden. So things like growing food directly next to the roadway. The county and sometimes the state even comes through to manage those things. Sometimes they just trim stuff, but you don't really know what may or may not have been sprayed there in order to maintain whatever they're tasked with maintaining. So I don't like to grow anything that I'm eating right next to the roadway, but you know, if you want to put some flowers right there, Maybe they might get uh, deadheaded a little early if they come to trim, but you're not you're not going to be exposing yourself to any sort of contamination if you're not eating it. Another thing to keep in mind is growing next to houses. I don't grow my food next to my house because you don't know what they threw in the soil when they were constructing the house. You know, I have an old house where lead paint is a potential thing, you know, that I might have to deal with in the soil around my house. So just as general rule, and because I'm fortunate enough to have enough space that I can just put my food elsewhere, those are those are really the main ones. Um, but if you're determined, there are things that you can do. There is something called phytoremediation, which is where you put plants in the ground and the plants take up that contaminant, and then you can throw that plant material away. Please don't put it in your compost because that's just going to put that contaminant that you worked so hard to pull out back into your soil system. So you would have to throw that away. But, you know, things like sunflowers are really good for that. And there's different vegetation you can use depending on what your concern is. But that would be your main course of action if you were actually looking to remove those materials from your soil so that you could confidently use it. Okay, so for that phytoremediation situation you're talking about i know that we've talked about this previously about roots and refuge using like mushrooms and sunflowers to kind of pull those things out of the soil that she didn't want there but mushrooms aren't necessarily an actual plant right they're a fungi so there's got to be more to soil than just the the dirt and then the organic matter so i feel like we should talk about what other things are in the soil. Absolutely. So soil is its own ecosystem. There is, you know, we we can't see most of it with our eyes, but there is so much going on there that because we can't see it, often we don't think about it. And honestly, there's a huge relationship between the bacteria in the soil, the fungi in the soil, and everything else and how they obtain their nutrients. You know, they work in symbiosis a lot of the time in order to both get something from the exchange where the fungus will get something and then the plant will get nutrients. And then there's also the things that we can see. Like we often think about worms being present in healthy soil, which worms are amazing. They will eat your scraps and give you worm castings, which is the perfect plant food. That's the perfect compost. So it's all very, very interrelated, and the soil microbiome is so important. Okay, because it's so important, are there certain ways that we as like gardeners, homesteaders who are out there trying to improve our soil, and we've talked about building the topsoil and everything, is there a way to build a better soil microbiome in in your garden? Definitely. So... One of the best ways to do that is going to be your no-dig and or no-till 
agricultural practices, which we have an entire podcast episode dedicated solely to that. So if you want to learn more about that, go check it out. But honestly, the best way is just going to be thinking about creating a place that they actually want to live. So that's going to be mulching heavily. That's going to create a habitat for them. That's going to attract them. They're going to want to be in your soil. I know I always see so many more worms where I have made sure to put mulch, but also keep mulch year round. Also, things like leaving your plant roots in the ground at the end of the season. I don't, unless they're diseased, I don't pull my plants up, roots included. I just cut them off at the top and then I leave those roots in the ground because that's worm food. You know, that's going to break down one way or another and that doesn't happen magically that's chemical reactions from things that are living in the soil that are consuming those also keeping living plants in that spot as much as possible so i don't deal with cover crops because i feel like i would plant cover crops and then not terminate them correctly and then have cover crops instead of a garden but <laughs> but if you're more organized <laughs> than myself you can look into things like that keeping those living roots in the ground as long as possible and then you know if you have the material and the space to do it keeping a compost pile is also great that's definitely going to attract worms that's definitely going to seed things with good bacteria and other you know tiny little microscopic organisms or you can also just even bury food scraps if that's all you can do. That's going to help too. And it is also possible to actually buy inoculants to put into your soil. So you can find them, I think, mostly at like agricultural stores where you can go to buy like a bunch of seed. Sometimes they'll have inoculants that they'll sell in addition to that seed to to help it grow because they have, you know, they know that there's an established relationship between those two things. Okay, that covers a lot of stuff, but we do have a few more questions from the Q&A from Instagram that we're going to go over. So I'm going to read through them, and as for the rest of the episode, Sage is the uh, expert here, so she's going to help answer them. <laughs> the The first one that we've got is, can using cover crops eliminate the need for buying compost? I can't keep buying compost because it's too expensive. Do I need cover crops? And then along with that, what soil amendments are most worth doing and aren't too expensive? The two best things that you can do are going to be add organic matter. <laughs> Again, I feel like a broken record. And also support the microbiome. But, you know, buying truckloads of compost or however you do it is is just gets expensive. And so if you don't want to spend the money on that, which understandable, there are other ways you you can do that. Um, you can collect leaves and grass clippings. You can buy straw, which tends to be cheaper. You can ask your neighbors for their yard waste for you to use in your garden. Uh, there are plenty of ways to find free resources for that. It does take extra effort to find those free resources, but it can be done. Um, and, you know, again, even if all you can do is just bury the food scraps that you generate in your own kitchen in your garden space, that's going to help. That's going to attract worms. They're going to leave those castings for you. And it's going to feed your garden plants and feed you the next year. And then as far as, you know, building that healthy microbiome goes, it takes patience and it goes back to everything that we talked about, you know, basically creating a space that they want to live. The next question is, is crop rotation actually necessary in a home garden or small homestead garden? I think that's going to depend on your garden to some extent. So I'll I'll answer with, you know, what what I do in mine or where I actually pay attention to rotation. So the first three years that I've been in this garden, which is from when I moved here until now, I have been really resistant to that because I don't know, there's just spots that, you know, I have my trellises put up. I don't really want to move it. It's just convenient to put it in the same spot. And it worked for the first few years. And now now I'm kind of noticing like, hey, I think I think it's time for me to move this spot. So with my tomatoes, I'm dealing with fungal issues. Part of that was because of just not favorable weather in the spring where it was just soggy and it wouldn't dry up. So that didn't help. So because I've had 
tomatoes in the same spot for three years, those diseases that overwinter in the soil, that live in the soil, given the right circumstances, you know, those pre-existing conditions basically can end up taking out your crop, which is kind of what's happened to a lot of my tomatoes this year. So I'm definitely going to be moving my tomatoes. I'm going to be rotating them as a crop next year. Same thing with my squash. Last year, I put my butternut squash off in a totally different location than my garden purely because of ease. It was not an intentional crop rotation. Those did great last year. I put the same things in my garden this year, and that's where all of those squash bugs, squash beetles, all the nasty stuff overwinters because I have my other squash plants in there. They did terrible. So there are some things where I think it makes sense, and it's going to depend on the diseases, the pests that you contend with in your garden, but I'm certainly not keeping track of every single thing that I've grown, exactly where I've grown it. Like celery, I don't feel the need to crop rotate, right? I don't deal with anything that that really disturbs it, and so I'm not going to put the time, effort, and energy into rotating that if it's not convenient for me. So I think it makes sense in certain circumstances, but it's not going to be the same for everybody. Yeah, and I guess my input on that is I've kind of had the experience where both last year, our first year having a garden here, we had horrible fungal issues on the tomatoes no matter what. And then this year, we also had the same issues and I did move them. So next year, I'm actually going to leave them in the same place, um, but try and make sure I'm cleaning the trellises off well and everything that I'm using on them to try not to spread that and just kind of see what happens since I'm dealing with it anyway. It, I feel like it also really depends on your gardening method too. Um, so like if you're tilling versus doing no-till, that could also change how you approach that. The next question on here is, how do sprays like herbicides, etc. affect the soil long term? This is going to completely depend on what is being sprayed and how much is being sprayed. There are a lot of different herbicides out there. They're all unique. And so how they're going to affect the soil long term, you know, both in their intended chemical composition and what they break down into totally depends on what you're using. But if I were to give a typical case, you know, typically anything that's sprayed is going to break down over the course of a year. So if it's sprayed this year, it's not going to be in your soil next year. Now, it doesn't magically disappear. It's being reacted out and remediated by that soil microbiome. And so it's turning into something else. And again, that's just going to depend on exactly what's sprayed. There's, there's no one answer for that. I'm just thinking about like all of the poison ivy around here and how whenever I look it up, it's either manual removal or spray glyphosate on it. And then I'm like, okay, well, then it's going to just flow down my big waterfall of a property, hit everything that I'm growing on the way, probably kill it all, and then go into my woods and down into the river. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> I think we both Goats. advocate for uh, not using sprays like herbicides and stuff if you don't have to um especially glyphosate yeah is not not one i'm a fan of but the sheep love it too so sheep and goats because i'm not pulling it all out <laughs> oh yeah i thought you meant the glyphosate for a second i was like they, they don't love that i'm pretty sure <laughs> they like the poison ivy. no That's they definitely don't love glyphosate no <laughs> it kills all their snacks and then the last question on here that we haven't answered was what is the best bagged soil to buy for starting a garden? Hmm. There are a lot of them. Um, so for a widely available option that you're probably going to be able to find almost no matter where you are, uh, I really like getting the organic miracle Grow. That's what I start all of my seeds in. I found it the first year. I started all my seedlings in it. It did great. And I just haven't really found a reason to move away from it. So that's my favorite. I'm curious if you have a favorite, Michaela. After trying the most recent one that I just tried, I do have a favorite and it's that one now. But I'm curious, do you use the miracle Grow potting soil or 
something else because there are different versions of it. That's a great point. So for starting my seeds indoors, I use the potting, I forget if it's potting soil or container mix. Those are the same thing in my mind. The container mix has more like chunky bits in it. So it's probably potting soil if you use it for seed starting. Mm, You're probably right. And then I know that they also stock miracle Grow organic garden soil, which looks almost the same. It's a little bit cheaper, but I do not use that to start my seeds in because it's very chunky. It's a lot of wood chip mulch. It's not good, especially because I use soil blocks, but that's intended to go in the ground where there is that microbiome that's going to, you know, react it out. It's going to eat all those things. So it's intended to go in the ground. Whereas, um, you know, the container mix of the potting soil doesn't, doesn't have to, and it has more immediate nutrients available in my opinion. That makes so much more what? sense than my like my assumption of why there are chunkier bits in the stuff that goes in either the raised beds or in the ground is because they can get away with doing that and you can't blame them for being there being chunky bits in it because they're like, oh, well, it's supposed to be in the ground. There's already chunky bits in the ground. <laughs> like, that's always <laughs> my, been my assumption. <laughs> um, but my favorite one is a semi-local one. Now it's it's called Mater Maker. And it's like a South Carolina potting soil, basically, and it's organic. Our local nursery sells it. I know Roots and Refuge recently recommended it earlier this year. And then I saw it at our local nursery and I was like, okay, well, I have to try it. And I really, really like how my fall seeds are doing with it. They're doing really well. It's a potting soil, so it's continuing to feed them. It's not just a seed starting soil. And then a few other ones that I have used in the past or I've seen other people use and they love our coast of Maine and happy frog soil. Happy frog I've seen. And then in and around Asheville specifically, I know that Dirtcraft organics is local to here, but it's a little bit out of my budget. So that's why I don't use it. If I had unlimited money, I would love to support them, but um, I don't have unlimited. (laughs) I don't have unlimited money, but then, you know, also really, if if you're curious, I would go talk to your local plant nursery and see what they recommend. They know that kind of stuff like the back of their hand because they deal with it all the time. And they probably even have have some available for sale. So that's what I would say. If you can't find these other ones or if they're cost prohibitive, I would just go talk to your local plant nursery. Yeah, ask them what they use because that's probably some good stuff. <laughs> All right. I hope that answered your questions without getting too bogged down in the details, without getting too confusing. And we have made a PDF for you guys as a free resource, and we will throw the link to that down in the description below. Thanks for joining us on this episode of She Said Homestead. We hope you enjoyed our chat. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to hear from you. Send your homesteading stories to us at shesaidhomestead at gmail.com. We can't wait to share them on the air. To stay connected, follow us on Instagram for updates and sneak peeks at what's coming up next. If you like video podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the She Said Homestead YouTube channel too. We can't thank you enough for being part of the She Said Homestead community. Until next time, happy homesteading.